Today, I am delighted to welcome two poets to the Inside Out Lecture Series, Stephen Soltansky from North America and Felipe Cusin from South America. We also need to thank our affiliate partner, the Lawrence Stone Trust, for making Stephen's visit possible by hosting him as poet in residence for one week at Shandy Hall in Coxwold, North Yorkshire. Thank you very much, Patrick. The format today is I will introduce Stephen, who will share his work with us for 30 minutes. I will then introduce Felipe, who will share his work with us for 30 minutes. And the two of them will have a conversation for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll throw it open to the floor for questions. So having got two very talented international poets in Leeds, we wanted to make the most of this unique opportunity. So there's another event this evening called The Ears Have No Lids. They really don't. Um, seven poets at the Tetley. Stephen and Felipe have kindly agreed to read again this evening and will be accompanied by two of our very own talented academics from Leeds Beckham University, Dr. Sean Ashton and Dr. Nasser Hussein, who will be joined by Anat Ben David, Orca Huitz, and Keisha Starrett. The evening event will also provide us with the opportunity to launch two new publications Stephen Zoltansky's On the Literary Means of Representing the Powerful as Powerless from Information as Material, York 2018, and Nasser Hussein's Sky Tip Ings, published by Coach House Press, Toronto 2018. So please do come along tonight, you're all very welcome. Stephen Zoltansky is the author of several books of poetry. Honestly, from Book Thug, 2018. Bribery, from Ugly Duckling Press, 2014. His critical writings have appeared in four columns, Art in America, Freeze, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Moose, and Elsewhere. In January 2017, an art <coughs> exhibition inspired by his book, Agony, Book Thug, 2012, entitled, You Can Tell I'm Alive and Well, Because I Weep Continuously was shown at the Knockdown Centre in Queens, New York. He lives in Copenhagen. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Stephen Sotansky. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to Simon for inviting me. Thank you to Patrick for hosting me. And I'm really happy to be uh, presenting alongside Felipe. Um, when Simon first asked me to give this talk, I thought it was like a proper academic talk, so I started working on a proper academic talk. And then uh, in communications with him, I realized that he was thinking of it more like an artist talk. So uh, what I have is a bit of a hybrid. The first, you know, 10 minutes or so will be maybe lightly theoretical, <laughs> and then I will go into some examples from my work. This talk is called Narrative and Hallucination, but from the start, I'd like to be clear. When I use the word hallucination, I don't mean to suggest a transcendent, mystical, or visionary experience. Rather, I'm using the word simply because it evokes a non-objective reality. The appearance of something that is not actually there, but nonetheless functions as real to various degrees for the person experiencing it. Of course, the hallucinatory, hallucinatory effects of reading are banal. Shifts in time that one doesn't quite notice, one's own psychological projections onto imaginary characters, the suggestion of profundity within the ambiguity of a symbol. These effects are not dramatic or visceral, and they often go unnoticed. For a long time, literary critics, and narratologists in particular, have stressed the non-linear and inconsistent nature of literary time. Gerard Jeanette, for example, pointed out that narrative does not proceed from beginning to end, but is riven with jumps forward and backward and with temporal omissions. Like, there's no story that simply goes from point A to point B in a, in a continuous line. Earlier than that, Sklovsky argued that literary <laughs> devices, in their artificiality, that is, literary form, are in conflict with the forward trajectory of a narrative. They interrupt the time of the book. The time of the narrative is interrupted when you notice the, the, the artificial forms that kind of create those effects. Moreover, narrative is a space of ideological projection for the dissemination and unspooling of fantasies. To mention just two famous examples, Kate Millett writes about literature as a space for the elaboration of fantasies about women and gender, 
And Toni Morrison writes about literature as a space which projects fantasies about race, precisely by often omitting any reference to it. Those ideological, cultural material, materials are projected onto the book by the readers. Uh, and of course, they exist in the book as manifested by the authors. So on the one hand, structuralist critics teach us about the textual mechanics of narrative, how it's built on recursion, anachronism, temporal gaps, and the intrusion of form. On the other hand, cultural critics teach us about the ideological projection involved in literature, how it is both a mirror of social life and a sponge for fantasy, whether intended by the author or not. And finally, in a different key, it's useful to bring up Robert Morris's argument about the non-identity of an artwork. He built his aesthetics around the fact that one can never take in the whole of a sculpture's shape at once. Instead, you hold the ideal of the sculpture in your mind, your idea of what it looks like, uh, while your perception is only taken in part of it. And this momentary perception is, of course, always in motion. So it's a difference between the whole object, that art object, and what you're actually seeing, which is always just a piece of it. A similar point could be made about reading. One doesn't ever see or perceive a whole book, and in fact, one forgets most of it. Instead, one holds an idea of the book in mind while moving through the text with uneven intention. As Tony Conrad said about music, the work and joy of listening are in the internal refractions between what is and what is imagined. I know that Felipe is interested in nothingness and literary attempts to figure or conjure nothingness. Our interests overlap here. And for me, this is one place where nothingness emerges in literature, in the irreconcilability between part and whole. The recurrence of this irreconcilability in a text or in the act of reading creates a sort of frequency of nothingness or a rhythm of nothingness. So if we think of the inconsistency of literature in terms of its structure, its relationship to fantasy and ideology, and the phenomenology experience of reading, phenomenological experience of reading, it becomes clear, I think, that the materiality of literature is not only grounded in the matter of language, the shape of words themselves, but in the structural cuts and psychological and cultural supplements that make it so that a text never can appear as a whole thing, but instead <coughs> something in motion and constantly changing. In this sense, narrative is hallucinatory. We watch things move in it that are not objectively there. Uh, this part is a little bit like maybe poetry inside baseball, but it's okay. In the last 10 years or so, many poets have increasingly turned to narrative forms. Some of the most interesting books of contemporary poetry, at least in my little corner of the poetry world, have been interested in playing with time and narrative. Books by Juliana Spar, Brandon Brown, Andrew Durbin, Bonu Capil, Robert Fitterman, Joseph Kaplan, Rin Johnson, J. Gordon Thaler, Tricia Lowe, and Shiv Kotecha, for example. These are all uh, uh, peers and uh, uh, other poets who are writing now, and uh, they've all come out of kind of an experimental poetry tradition but are more and more using narrative forms. These books are far more narrative than many books of experimental poetry were 10 years ago, and more accommodating of direct political and personal expressions. Part of this turn is undoubtedly a response to the overlapping crises that we now face, climate change, the consolidation of wealth, the rise of ethno-nationalism. In the face of these urgencies, it makes sense that writers would be turning to narrative forms in order to make more directly political statements. But I don't think it's all about directness. Rather, it's contradictory. On the one hand, sure, poets feel the need to speak up, to clearly take a position, and to affirm their personal experience as valuable in and of itself. And narrative is very good for that. On the other hand, narrative is exceptionally good at producing temporal distortions that complicate, undermine, or amplify such directness, so that it can feel either excessive or perverse, insufficient, and yearning. In a broad sense, I think poets' work with time as a literary material pushes against the fear of un oncoming unstoppable doom, against the nihilism of a predetermined future. It creates a multi-directional and open sense of time, history, and possibility. Moreover, it pushes against a sense of alienation and atomization. This tendency to narrative manifests a kind of linked perspectivism, in which any number of partial perspectives any number of lived experiences, are articulated such that they overlap at their divergencies, and the boundary between commonality and difference becomes confused. 
I recently made a more direct political argument about literary time in a book that Simon uh, just published on the literary means of representing the powerful as powerless, which is an essay poem arguing that literature has a special tendency to figure powerful people as weak. Uh, my argument is basically that literature, more than any other art form, uh, has an interest in depicting the powerful as internally divided, actually weak, actually fragile. Their power is always contingent. Uh, and the book kind of non-exhaustively catalogs and analyzes examples of this. I don't use the term hallucination in the book, but it might be possible to say that an understanding of power's contingency that I found was embedded in literature is a kind of hallucinated knowledge. It's common, everyday knowledge, and necessary for hope in any political struggle. And yet it is not objective. You can't simply discover it in reality. At the end here, this part of the talk, I have to admit, I may drop the term hallucination. I've never used it before, and this talk will probably be the only time I ever use it. I haven't thought about it, and I didn't consider it while reading any of my other previous books. Although, uh, while writing any of my previous books. Although, to be honest, I often don't know what I'm thinking while I'm writing my books. Hallucination for me is a provisional idea. I like it for now because it situates ideology and experience in the body, and it relates to a pleasure and disorientation of reading. Okay. End of lightly theoretical opening. Now I will kind of read from um, a few of my works. I'll read from my new book tonight, but tonight, today I want to read some excerpts from three books that form a sort of loose trilogy. Agony, Bribery, and Honestly. Each of them uses a different lens, so to speak, to contort autobiographical and political content. The first book, Agony uses mathematical calculations to situate and desituate my body in cultural and affective spaces. Here's a, a section of agony. You can tell I'm alive and well because I weep continuously. Given that the average person in a lifetime sheds about 4,167.921 cubic inches of tears, and I'm somewhere around one-third of the way through my life, then we can assume that, so far, I've shed about 1,373.034 cubic inches of tears. Since water makes up 60% of a human body, and the volume of the average body is 5,064.97 cubic inches, then we know that the volume of water in an average human is 3,038.982 cubic inches. And so, so far, in my lifetime, I've shed about 45.181% of my body's water in tears, since tears are mostly water. Let me see here. We can assume that if, instead of crying now and again, at moments in which my emotions are particularly pitched, I cried all my tears at once in one single feat of spasmodic emotional courage, I would dehydrate myself. This is perhaps why feelings are so constant, so as not to be simultaneous, which would end in dehydration. The volume of each tear, on average, is 0.01 cubic inches. So, I've shed, so far, at least 144,419.5 tears, more or less, which, my, which means I have at least 232,907.25 tears left to shed. If I want to get all future crying out of the way at once, and I was able, as we've implied as impossible, to narrowly focus my emotional energy into one courageous spasmodic surge, then I'd end up shedding 91.968% of my body's water at once, which is 55.181% of my body's total volume. And so, the consequence of this splurge, which would at least do me the favor of removing all future psychic obstacles from my path, would be complete disfigurement and, I suppose, death. In fact, it seems that in order to keep on living, a human being must be willing and able to shed his or her tears at a rather slow and regulated pace, every now and then. Say that I cry 28 times a year, which seems like an arbitrary number, but which is my age, written like 10 years ago, and which seems like a lot, but also seems about right. Though perhaps I cry less if I have no lover that year. So, given that the life expectancy of a U.S. male is 74.37 years, we can assume that I cry about 56 0.028 cubic inches of tears a year, in a year with a lover or lovers, and that I shed 2.001 cubic inches of tears every time I cry. However, we can also assume that I cried more tears 
as a child than I do as a young adult, and that I will cry less tears as a old man, hopefully, than I do as a young one. We can guess that, in the end, the end being the end of my life, these dry spells will even out with the floods, and I'll be left with an average, as we've said, of having shed 56.028 cubic inches a year, or so. So then, each year, I shed only 1.844% of my body's water. And say I drink five glasses of water a day. Given that each glass of water is, on average, 72.39 cubic inches, we can conclude that I drink, on average, 361.95 cubic inches of water per day, not to mention the water content of solid food. So I drink 132,111.75 cubic inches of water a year, or 4,314.331% of my body's water. Therefore, crying at the pace at which I now cry poses absolutely no threat to my hydration, as far as I can tell. But say there's a year in which I have a new lover every day, or one especially upsetting lover for the entire year, and I end up crying three times a day, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, for instance. Given that one doesn't cry continuously, we can guess that each crying fit lasts 10 minutes or so, on average. So we can further assume that one sheds 0 0.200 cubic inches of tears a minute when crying, or 0 0.003 cubic inches a second. So that, if I someday live or already have lived my year of tumultuous love with either a new lover every day or one especially upsetting lover for the entire year and cry for 1,800 seconds per day, I will, or did, shed 2,191.095 cubic inches of tears in that year. 6.003 a day. Into my hands or onto the bare shoulders of my lover or lovers. But still in no danger of dehydration. Unless, that is, as is especially a risk in the case of my one especially upsetting lover, I cry near continuously, or as close as I can get to near continuousness, which would be, in this case, crying continuously while awake. Given that I'd be awake for 15 hours a day, on average, or 54,000 seconds, given that I'd sleep more than usual because I'd be depressed. I now shed 162 cubic inches of tears a day, or 59,130 a year which is 45% of the amount of water I drink from glasses. Other factors now become increasingly relevant. For example, a particularly upsetting relationship does not consist uh, simply of heartbreak, but of passionate reconciliation followed by passionate reconciliatory sex. Remember, though, I am crying throughout. Given that one sweats during sex and dribbles some amount of saliva into one's partner's mouth and onto their body, and so on. So now, this year I am losing quite a bit of water content due to my especially upsetting lover, onto whose shoulders I cry from the moment I wake up until the moment I fall asleep. And if we assume that 4,927,500 of my tears run down her shoulders, then we can also assume that I'm finally risking dehydration and death, leaving aside the big problems of evaporation and salt content for now. Okay, <laughs> that's selection from agony. <clears throat> so the next book, I give up the mathematical stuff. It's more like a dramatic monologue. It's called Bribery. And in it, the narrator confesses to unsolved crimes in New York City and rants about politics. Um, I'll just read one. If there's one thing that's certain for everyone at all times, no matter where they live or what they obsess over unreasonably, it's that one can't, at any given moment, get any worse than one already is without sliding into another moment altogether. Of course, I'm already awful, but only as awful as I am right now, and just as one holds out hope for tomorrow, knowing it will be better than today, if only because, finally, today will be gone, I hope when I'm worse, I'll be better too. Better, for example, the way women are better than men because they have to put up with men like saints while men go around giving the impression they're men like assholes. Better the way that poor people are better than rich people because they take what the rich people hand out to them like monotonous jobs and fast food and jail time and work-related bladder cancer. <coughs> better the way non-white people are better than white people because they aren't allowed to write the oppressive laws they live under or order the police into their neighborhoods to beat the shit out of their kids. Better the way children are better than adults at being unable to fight back when their parents take out their failures in them. 
Better the way whoever is being bombed right now by American planes is better than the pilots of those planes because they're scattered in more pieces and cover more area. Better the way every other person will always be better than me simply by being bigger than me. Their thoughts and actions everywhere and not. And so on and so on. One thing is better than another forever until you die. But for now, if I live even one more day, if this isn't the last time I taste water, sweat through my shirt, squint, run my tongue over dry lips, find myself unable to speak, cover my eyes, then I won't escape a certain extra degree of dipshit eternity. I'll end up giving myself at least one more thing to hate about myself, either by doing something I think I dislike, or by doing something I think other people dislike, like committing some more crimes, which, like the laws they protect, are everywhere at once, written down. There are plenty to choose from. For example, robbing a store at knife point. I did that. I pulled on a skeleton mask and went with two friends to a little bodega on Bleecker and Fourth, and we filmed ourselves pushing the clerk into the back room and basically giving him a hard time and grabbing him around the belly and out shaking him as if coins would fall out of his armpits. He was soft and scared and had no idea we weren't there to hurt him. A few times he even laughed quietly, it sounded more like coughing, when we poked or pushed him, as if he was trying to get in on the joke and play along. At some point he tripped and almost fell over, but I held him up by the arms while he steadied himself. For some reason, I expected him to thank me, which of course he didn't because I was robbing him. So I said thank you for him, to him, very softly, and he stared at the floor and coughed again, but it didn't sound like laughing anymore. We didn't take much money because there wasn't much to take and that was fine. We weren't really there for the money anyway, and I mostly regret propping the clerk back up, not because it would have been funny to see him fall, it might not have been, but because letting him tumble would have been a small enough form of self-relinquishment to make him, me seem ridiculous, but not quite as terrible as I'd like. Because I like to disappoint myself, to make myself sad. It feels good. It would have been better if I had not only robbed the store and poked the clerk's gut, but also pushed him over, if not on his face, then at least on his knees, and even more humiliating and in position. This extra little flourish of cruelty might have granted me a sense of power over him that I would not have wanted and would not have been and would have been too much for me. But instead, I intuitively reconciled my crime to my sense of self by doing something just a little bit nice, and not even nice in a way meant to facilitate the patient savoring of a greater cruelty, like buying a lover dinner right before abandoning them in the street, but nice in a nice way, though I know the clerk didn't experience my gesture of kindness in terms of kindness, which is a relief. And I can always do something worse, which is also a relief. So in that book, which obviously takes a lot of great pleasure in being kind of uh, perverse and cruel, I was thinking uh, about one way of distorting narratives and distorting narratives of kind of uh, complicity, especially uh, coming from the US where you're complicit with uh, endless structural damage. Um, I was thinking about those kind of allegories of uh, complicity also in terms of horror movies. And one of the, the interesting things I think about horror movies is how they distort and pervert those allegories. So think of a movie like, like The Purge, if anybody here has seen like The Purge, where uh, it's, uh, it's great. And the, 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 basically the plot is that there's like a new right-wing government that takes over the US. Um, and they institute this like night called Purge Night, where everybody gets to do crimes and like kill everybody. But really, it's a it's a way of population control. They mean to like uh, to kill off the poorer parts of the population and pit them against each other. Uh, but what's great about the movies is it's, it's kind of like a clear allegory for U.S. politics, except that the movie is so perverse and so like over the top and so excessive that the allegory gets totally fucked up. And you're watching it, you're trying to map the allegory onto the actual movie and it doesn't really work. And so what I was interested in here um, in terms of the genre and in terms of horror and in terms of like uh, uh, the excessiveness of criminality is a way of kind of writing a piece that was this kind of clear political allegory but that the allegory becomes ruined in the, the effusiveness of it. Okay. <coughs> I blow the water? Yeah. Okay. All right, so lastly, I'll just read the section of the last part of this uh, trilogy thing. This book is called Honestly. And uh, in it, I really wanted to move away from this kind of uh, absurdist rendering of, of the self, which I've been working on. And I wanted to work on writing that was more open uh, to the social and more dialogic. So much of the book, probably more than half of it, is composed out of interviews with other people. So there's there's some of my own writing, of course, but uh, a lot of it is other people talking to me. And I will read 
just the opening passage of it, which is probably in some ways the most narratively straightforward, in which I'm learning about, uh, well, it comes out of research I did about a, a great uncle of mine who was uh, kicked out of our family. So you, you'll get the idea. I never met my great uncle, Dick Stryker, but about 10 years ago, while visiting family, I found his copy of Joyce's Ulysses. The inside cover was stamped with his name, and the pages were dotted with marginalia. I asked my parents who he was, but it had been so long since anyone had mentioned him that they could barely remember the rumors. He was a pianist and a composer. He was jailed for being a conscientious objector during World War II. He spent two years in a prison in Ohio. His father kicked him out of the family. He moved to New York. He was gay. He was an alcoholic. At some point, he burned his face off. He might have been homeless for a time. He refused to have anything to do with his family. I wanted to know more. I wanted to get a slightly stronger, mild, I wanted to feel a slightly stronger, mild connection to this person I'd never heard of. At first, it was hard to find information about him. As you might expect, his name is difficult to Google. There are many Dick Strikers, and most of them are synonymous authors of porn. But I did find a reference to our Dick Stryker, my Dick Stryker, participate, participating in an early production by the Living Theater, which was like a New York-based uh, avant-garde theater group in the 50s and 60s. And this led me to the published diaries of its founder, Judith Molina, which contain frequent references to Dick. Turns out he was roommates with Molina and her partner and collaborator, Julian Beck, and he wrote music for many of their early plays. Unfortunately, the diaries don't provide many personal details, but the glimpses into the company he kept suggest that he lived an active artistic life, despite his eventual obscurity and disappearance. He hung out with John Ashbery and Frank O'Hara. He played one of the radios in the first performance of John Cage's Imaginary Landscapes 4. He studied with composer Lou Harrison. He wrote the score for one of Jackson McClough's plays, and Larry Rivers played saxophone on the recording. I have no idea if this recording still exists. Probably not, but I hope so. He attended anarchist meetings. He dated a poet, Harold Morse, who wrote many poems about the tumultuous relationship, which aren't very good. He had difficulty finding work because he was a felon. He washed dishes. He frequently missed attending or participating in concerts because he was washing dishes. The most moving anecdote in the diaries is a prank. Dick and Judith attend a seance, but he won't behave. Either he's angry at his friends, or he can't take the ritual seriously. For one reason or another, he continually acts up. He spells out evil messages on the Ouija board, and is eventually kicked out of the seance when he forms the word hate. When I read this, Dick came alive to me. I felt close to him. On the one hand, I simply love that he made a life so far from his conservative suburban roots that he conjured spirits with weirdos in the East Village, participating in things that people in our family would find pointless, unproductive, and unusual. But even better, I love that he refused to play along, that he fucked it up, that he threw cold water on everyone else's optimism with a harmless and silly but slightly mean joke, a life-affirming kind of joke, probably funnier in retrospect. But later in the book, he and Judith get into a physical altercation. The incident is recorded in detail in Harold Norse's memoir. Backstage after a concert, Dick confronted Judith about a debt. She slapped his face, he pushed her. She tried to steal a flute from a flautist with the intention of beating Dick with it. The flautist wouldn't let go and struggled with Judith. She bit his hand until he bled, and then Dick spat on her and ran away. It wasn't the end of their friendship. They continued to live and work together. But a year later, he moved out, and after that, his name rarely appears in her diaries. I emailed Judith. This was a while ago. She died uh, maybe two years ago. So. She wrote back immediately, excitedly. She was so happy to hear from a relative of Dick's. He was a dear friend, but then he dropped out of her life. She didn't know what happened to him. No one knew what happened to him. She was eager for news. She wanted me to put her in touch with him. She wanted to see him again. I wrote back and corrected the misunderstanding. Dick had been dead for 15 years. I didn't know what happened to him either. That's why I had written. I was hoping she had more information. I was hoping she would share memories. I was hoping she could tell me more about his personality. I wanted to know what he was like. She didn't respond. I asked my grandmother about Dick. They were close as children. He was a musical boy. He loved Wagner. She hated Wagner. But she didn't know anything about his adult life. The last time she saw him was 1948, at her wedding. I told her that I learned more about him, 
Then he moved to New York and hung out with artists and writers whom I admired, people I tried to copy in my own writing, people from a certain bohemian milieu considered very important by artists today. She said, but I don't know why he never came to see me again. I don't know why he never called me or answered my letters. I don't know why he stopped talking to me. A few years later, I attended a talk by Judith and afterwards introduced myself as the great nephew of Dick Stryker. At the mention of her own old friend, she became flustered, told me repeatedly how much she loved Dick and how much I looked like him. You look just like him. I'm so happy to see you. You have his hair. You're bringing back memories. I miss him. It's been so long. I've missed him for so long. I was happy to be told I looked like Dick. It made me feel like we were linked, like there was a connection between us more fundamental than my occasional shallow curiosity about his life, a living piece of him hidden in me that I was about to discover. But when I proudly relayed this story to my grandmother, she was baffled. You look nothing like him, nothing at all. That's ridiculous, completely ridiculous. Eventually, I was able to track down two of Dick's surviving friends, and they told me what they could remember or what they wanted to tell. They lingered on the sad trajectory of Dick's life, though they also made clear that he was private and that there was a lot they didn't know. I was disappointed that neither of them commented on my resemblance to Dick. He was a happy young man, though he had bouts of depression and an occasional, occasional tendency to self-harm. He had lots of friends. He drank a lot. The fact that he had actually been to jail for his beliefs made a big impression and people looked up to him. He was activist in the active in the pacifist movement and knew Bayard Rustin from political meetings. Uh, Bayard Rustin, if, if you're not familiar with him here, he's, he's, uh, he was one of a, a civil rights leader and one of Martin Luther King's advisors, and he's widely credited as the person who uh, introduced Martin Luther King Jr. to the concept of nonviolence. But he was also gay, and so the civil rights leaders kept him kind of buried and less public. Than others. He kept getting arrested for having public sex. So back to Dick. He became introduced interested in Gestalt psychology and was a patient of Isidore Fromm for a time, though nobody knows how he could afford it. He always hung around poets, but was never interested in reading poetry. He seems to have broken the young James Baldwin's heart. He had some early success as a composer. He wrote an or organ, Passacaglia, that was performed by a famous organist at Columbia University. The orchestrated version won third prize from a music foundation and was performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in a rehearsal. Dick's friends pooled their money to send him to Chicago to hear his music, but they didn't have enough. At this point, the story gets hazy before getting clear again. In his late 50s, in the late 50s, he had an affair with a poet named Murray that was so all-consuming that he stopped focusing on composition. Murray had a wife and kids, but his wife knew about Dick and they were all close. So when Murray's family moved to San Francisco, Dick moved with them. That didn't go well, and so Dick moved back to New York but he remained close to Murray, who died of leukemia a few years later. After that, his love life remained unstable, though I don't know the details. I wish I did. I want to pry. Then he almost died in a fire. One of his friends told me, this is all a quote. The fire was probably in 1971 on Perry Street. He was smoking and fell asleep and it started. He tried to escape, but couldn't get the bars out of his windows. The firemen broke in and found him badly burnt and unconscious. They said he had actually inhaled flame. His lungs were charred. He was disfigured and they had to reconstruct his face. They sewed new eyelashes on. They built a new nose using the skin from his arm. They attached the skin from under his right arm to his nose and then held his arm over his head for three months while it fused with the skin on his face. He always looked disfigured after that. The joints in his fingers were burnt and no longer worked. They had to cut the joints and remake the fingers. His fingers were bent back for the rest of his life. He also gained a lot of weight after this because he was not very mobile. He spent a total of about 10 months in the hospital. The fire probably destroyed most of his spores. When we visited him in the hospital, he was unrecognizable except for his laugh." End of quote. Unable to work and living on disability benefits, he became a loner, refusing to see many of his old friends because he was ashamed of his face. Mostly he stayed indoors and listened to Renaissance music. He withdrew from social life and ra rarely composed. This is another quote. One of the few pieces of music he wrote after the fire was for a doctor named Dr. D. Filippi. When he was slipping in and out of consciousness in the emergency room, he said that every time he woke up, Dr. D. Filippi would be sitting there praying for him, even though he didn't know him. 
He might, have, he might have credited this praying with saving his life. Maybe it was a religious conversion. He remained friends with Dr. DiFilippi. Later, the doctor's wife was murdered, and Dick wrote him a piece of music as a gift or an elegy. End quote. A few years before he died, Dick fell down the subway steps. The station was missing his handrails because of construction. He was badly hurt and sued the city. But this money made his last years easier until he got lung cancer. He was in chemo and doing well, but then he caught a, caught a cold and died of pneumonia. OK, so as you can see in that one, I'm moving towards uh, more straightforward uh, language, more straightforward sentences, less ornamentation, uh, and much more uh, uh, actual transcriptions of vernacular speech. And one of the things that I'm thinking about in this book is like how to create these temporal distortions, how to recreate um, kind of like odd shifts in time, but with with simpler means, without the kind of uh, the overwroughtness <laughs> of some of my previous writing. Um, so I hope that that was interesting. And I think that's all I got. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Steve. Um, next we have uh, Professor Felipe Kisson, who teaches at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Santiago in Chile. His main fields of research are experimental literature and mysticism. And now he investigates contemporary representations of nothingness. And it's a, a little bit annoying, but um, I have a fantastic book about nothingness, which I wanted to show Felipe, and I saw it three days ago. And I just spent sort of 50 minutes this morning looking in my office like crazy, and couldn't find the book on nothingness. But well, that's, that's the sort of thing that happens. He has recently published Quick Faith, Records Without Records from 2015. The book's explicit content, Gauss, PDF, 2015. Closed caption, Gauss, 2016. Regional restrictions, Gauss, 2017. Letras, Gegen, 2017. And the project, Corrections with Information as Material, 2016. Please join me in extending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to Professor Philippe Cousin. Thank you very much, Simon, for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here along with Steve and with all of you. And I'm really proud to talk in this university that honors the legacy of one of my favorite writers of all time, Samuel Beckett. Um, I will talk about my my trilogy, another <laughs> another trilogy uh, that's composed about. Uh, Three of the books that Simon uh, just mentioned, um, explicit content, closed caption, and regional restrictions. And um, I, I will start with an anecdote. Uh, I was participating in a reading uh, two years ago at uh, Printed Matter in New York, one of the best uh, bookstores uh, there, uh, a reading that was organized by Simon and Nick Thurston. And that day I read a sample, a selection of those three books. Uh, I was really happy when I was reading it. It was a very important reading for me uh, because uh, it happened something that never has uh, occurred to me before. As I was reading the poem, uh, it completely changed to me what I thought about my own writing. So uh, I will tell you later <laughs> what was that happened that day. But uh, please remember that anecdote when we, we get uh, to, the, uh, to this. So now I will tell you how I wrote Trilogy. This uh, series of three books is based, based generally in, in one general theme. The experience of watching movies experience of everyone has watching movies today, not in the cinemas, but in our computers, our iPads, and also the what happens when you are 
as in my case, not only watching the movie, but at the same time looking at a database, looking at a website, uh, stopping and checking for something, etc. Um, also, uh, this has to be with a particular experience, very typical uh, in every country or in South America, that is that uh, most of the movies we, we watch in all our life come from, from the United States. Usually we, we saw them with uh, Spanish subtitles, but uh, when we're watching Netflix or YouTube or Amazon Video or whatever, uh, sometimes we, we see them with uh, subtitles in English, for example, and a lot of different things uh, happen with, uh, with that. Uh, because of that, uh, I, I wanted, before having like a clear concept of all the books, uh, to write them in English. Uh, I come from Chile, we, we talk in, Spain, uh, in Spanish, as you can see, I am not very good uh, speaking English, I, and I, I don't know really how to write properly a book in, in English. I, the, the best I can do is like send emails to Simon to get invited to this place, but nothing more. So that's a good thing, of course, but, um, but I'm not able to write a proper poem in, in English. So uh, to write this book, uh, I, I did what I could, so, so I sampled uh, texts written in English and combined them, uh, edited them in a way that I think I, I, I didn't make too much mistakes. I'm, I'm really not completely sure if I made some mistakes or, or not. Um, and I also, uh, before I finish these books, uh, I was thinking also in publishing them in the United States because the world that uh, these uh, books were related was uh, American movies. So, another <laughs> coincidence so, uh, of what you were talking also. Like, part of uh, our imaginary is full of uh, American movies. So, um, I, I started thinking in some uh, publishing houses I really like, like uh, Gauss PDF or Troll Thread, and I proposed these books to Gauss PDF. Uh, it's a place where you can publish your, your books in, in PDF and they can be downloaded for free. So for me it was uh, a very good option and I was really happy that Gordon Failor, the editor, was happy to include the, the books in that, in that collection. Um, Another thing that uh, was important for me is uh, more specific to the place where I live and the place where I work. I, I teach at the University of Santiago de Chile. Uh, all of my colleagues are really interested in Latin American literature, Latin American culture, Latin American identity. Uh, and I, I, I always kind of complicated with thinking too much of, of my own identity. I mean, I, I live in Chile, but what more do you want? I mean, I'm, I'm already enough Chilean to live in Chile and to know uh, without uh, thinking too much, uh, receiving too much of Chilean culture, so I don't want to study. <laughs> I, I, I'm already receiving. Uh, so that's why I, I like very much to teach uh, literature from Europe, from, from the United States, etc kind of mix uh, everything together. Uh, so, uh, also it was important to me like to write a book in English like like a provocation to my colleagues and especially to the Chilean poets. I think that the Chilean poetry is the most important thing in the world, like probably every poet in, in his own country, his uh, her own country. So, I wanted to do that also as a, as a provocation. And in fact, uh, when I published these books in the United States, I made a launch party in Chile to show these books that you just could download them in, in PDF. Uh, so that was like the general idea, and I, I will show you uh, briefly uh, how these books are and how they were written. This is the, the website of Gauss PDF, and here you can download, it says very little, the book uh, explicit content. This is the cover, it's really simple, and I made the PDF in, in a really simple document. And this is how we, it started. Um, I wanted to uh, to work about something that was really funny for me. When I was, every time I was watching a movie, I, I, I 
check this uh, website, this uh, database, uh, IMDB, Internet Movie Database, maybe all of you know it. And uh, it has the ratings, the reviews, etc. But also it has a wonderful section called Parental Advisory. And there are the comments of the parents that, that say, oh, there's violence, there's sex, there's nudity, there are uh, profanity, say, yeah, yeah, bad, bad words, etc. And I started getting really crazy with those comments because they were really pornographic. I mean, people, like every, every sensor is really into, really <laughs> obsessed with sex, with nudity, with violence, etc. So I wanted to uh, take some of those uh, lines and, and combine them together to, to make a book. The thing is, uh, I didn't know which movies uh, to choose because there were, all of them have the, this, this comment. So I, I preferred, uh, the first focus was, was I will choose only American films because I, I, I'm trying to write in English and, and that culture. But uh, I said I will let Hollywood decide for me which are the best films I could use. So I, I checked this list, Hollywood's uh, 100 favorite films, and uh, I checked not, not of the 100, but of like 30 or 40 of these uh, movies, I checked the comments of the parents. For example, here are some of them, of El, the, the Godfather, and they are classified for sex and nudity, violence and gore, etc. These are comments of anonymous fathers. I, I really, well, some of them, it appears the name, but these are uh, anonymous people that obviously I don't, I don't know. So I took them, I, I downloaded them, and then I started classifying. They, well, this is how it works. It says Accidentes Enfermedad in Spanish. <laughs> the, the, the name for the, for example, this is a group of, of those, uh, of those, lines, those descriptions, but I, I took a, a decision that was really important. I took away every reference to the actual movies, so if there was the name of a character, of, or of a country, or of a specific place, I, I took it out. So you could combine them uh, in a very random way, and they would, wo uh, they would work together fine, because uh, there was no uh, line uh, connection, direct connection between them. Some of them, if you if you uh, read about a Velociraptor or a dinosaur, oh, you say Jurassic Park or or a sheep, it might be Titanic. But but usually you you just can combine them. Uh, and the very important thing uh, I did for for this was trying to uh, because I didn't know what to do with all this material was trying to. Uh, how do you say, shuffle them uh, in a very, very random way. And this is uh, a very important part. Uh, in that moment, I was thinking a lot in one of the things I do most besides of writing and, and teaching is making music. I, I, I make electronic music, some poetry, and I like very much to work with sequences. Every time you, you hear uh, electronic music, you're hearing repetitive sequences. And I like that, that idea of the sequence, but also you can program random sequences. So just to put one sample here, one sample there, another and in different orders. So I, I had this idea in my mind. Of course, when I, when I wrote the, the, the book, it was like copy-pasting and moving in different orders. And, and, and at a certain moment, it was OK, and I, and I finished. And that's how the actual uh, poems work. Uh, each poem, I, I don't, in fact, I hate talking about this as poetry. For me, it's more like narrative than poetry, because these are like little scenes from movies. So, but maybe in the whole concept, it's more poetry-like. So, for example, I'll, I'll read a little. A man grabs and forces a kiss on another man. Two characters engage in a long fight to the death. Domestic violence may be intense for certain viewers. The story is very strong in terms of sentimental disease and disaster violence, etc., etc. And at the end of each section, I put all the profanities. Five uses of shit, along with half a dozen other profanities that include them, hell, son of a bitch, got them, and Jesus. Oh my God is uttered over a dozen times. <laughs> Just to imagine a people counting the profanities uh, in a home is really crazy. I, I really love that. Well, when, when I get the chance to present this book in Chile, I wanted to do something with this 
random sequence idea I, I had in mind. So I took the, uh, this is the software, I, it's a very typical software for, for electronic <coughs> music, if some of you makes music must know it, it's able to live. And what I did, is, it was, I, I always get the help of my computer, I, I asked my computer to read the, the text. So I took this very typical program, speech, uh, text to speech, and the computer read some of the, of the, of the text, for example, here. That, that's an example. I, I put some reverbs, but I, I wanted to play with this uh, with this random idea, so I organized four tracks. These uh, orange clips, uh, each of one has one of the different uh, uh, sentences, the different lines, and I program it to uh, move randomly. Yeah, so uh, they will they will be uh, sounding like one of them appears, one disappears, etc. And, and I also put, and um, this is more technical, this, I put an LFO. LFO is like moving a knob, right? So the LFO all, all also controls the panning, like left, right, the volume, and the, and the distance the, of the river. So you can feel like they are moving in like very uh, odd ways. And when I read it uh, aloud, and, and I also make like a sound art piece of 30 minutes just reading this material, what I did was uh, I put this as a soundtrack, and over that I read the text in Spanish uh, with a translation of uh, Google Translation, not my direct translation, a very robotic uh, translation, and I read over this. And I also projected the, the, the same text in, in random way. So, at the same time, you, you would be hearing like four voices watching the, the text and me reading the spine. So it was really, really a mess. Yeah. I, I will show you very little how this is, how this sounds. The, the white ones are, the, are blank. So I want to, to mix. Uh, silences and speech. She removes her top, revealing her hair dress. They kiss him. The girl over the thing could be very offensive. This is a, a little sample, and I show you. Uh, I made later a video with all this. I'll show you just a little to get an idea. On, it goes along, and as you can see, it is really difficult to to understand really what is happening. It's like an explosion of all this uh, violent uh, or or sexual issues like getting into your mind. So. In, in my case, and, and I think that, that that's something I really would like to talk later, uh, it, it was very important to convert a very straightforward book, a PDF document, really simple in its uh, layout and like very directed to your to your mind, to convert it in a more uh, sensitive, uh, more sound, more visual uh, experience. I mean, that's that's I think I've been uh, thinking of lady and and was something that I really wanted to achieve uh, in this uh, case. The second book is uh, <coughs> closed caption, and this also relates to, as I told you, an experience that is really common uh, for everyone living uh, outside uh, the United States when you want to watch a movie uh, and, and you don't have the subtitles in your own language and you have to uh, 
use the English sub subtitles. But in the case of a, a English language movie, the English uh, language subtitles use, usually are closed uh, captioned uh, subtitles that include the description of the audio for the for the people that can hear for the for the deaf. So it's a very I assume some of, some of you have done it. Uh, uh, one time, and it's very strange to sometimes even the the actual uh, translation of the subtitle is not uh, not the not the translation the transcription of the subtitle sometimes it's not the same as what you're hearing it's not always exact but it's also like a very strange uh, experience for someone for someone who can hear to uh, hear a, a car and it says a car is approaching or to hear a birds and the birds are singing. Uh, it's a, a really odd experience, like a duplicated uh, experience, and I wanted also to, to play with this. In this case, um, this is the book, and I wanted to, to, to play with a, another idea for the selection of the movies. I didn't want to uh, take the same movies uh, the, the last time, but uh, I, I wanted to, to use <coughs> only movies that I, that I haven't seen, but very, very famous movie. And I haven't seen, I can tell you, I'm, I'm really proud that I haven't seen Schindler's List, I haven't seen Titanic, I haven't seen Jurassic Park, I haven't seen Saving Private Ryan, and, and another one. So it's just five really, really famous movies uh, that I haven't seen, that I haven't heard. Uh, of course, I've seen and heard about them a lot, but I haven't seen them uh, directly. And to get the these closed caption subtitles, I searched, there are lots of uh, websites with the, uh, with the subtitles and I took them from opensubtitles.org and I downloaded the text files. So I have the complete text, if you want to read it, like a book of, uh, for example, Titanic. And uh, this is the start of Titanic and it says sonar echoing, sonar echoing, muffled radio chatter, then a dialogue, you should see it muffle right with chatter, etc. It was difficult uh, for me to gather all this material because I would have to read uh, the, the complete text. I didn't want to read the text. I didn't want to see the movie. So what I discovered is was that the closed caption were always with a parenthesis. So I started searching parenthesis and taking the, the material. It was, a, it was like an hour I was taking this material. And then I started to uh, put them in groups put them together, and uh, I, in this case I was trying to produce something more like a, um, uh, like a concrete poem. Yeah, they are like very, I choose uh, phrases, uh, descriptions from different movies, again, uh, I put them together without any specific reference, but trying to put them uh, together like, like lists. Uh, so I produce, for example, uh, this is typing quickly, typing normally, Typing slowly, typing slowly, typing slowly, typing <coughs> extremely slow, barely typing, inaudible. Inaudible is my favorite, of course. It appears uh, lots of times. Um, last year, I collaborated with uh, some really cool uh, students from a uh, Catholic University in Chile. Uh, they were from, they were starting design, not literature, not arts. And uh, I collaborated to produce uh, a couple of artist books. Uh, and then when I had the chance to present this book in Chile, I asked them to produce a video. Uh, I didn't give them any indication. It was just do whatever you like with this and we'll show it at the, at the launch of the book. And I will show you the, the, the video they, they made. They are uh, Sofia Garrido, Camila Romero, and Matias Gal, who, who did a wonderful job. Distant, distant, distant shouting, distant, distant screaming, screaming, distorted voice echoing. Sonar echoing, sonar echoing, muffled radio chatter. Sonar echoing, sonar echoing, muffled radio chatter. Sonar echoing. Sonar, Sonar echoing. echoing. 
ship's, ship's horn blowing. blowing. Car, Car horn, horn honking. honking. Horn honking. honking. Honks, 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 honks horn. horn. Officer, Officer shouting, shouting indistinctly. indistinctly. Soldier Officer shouting indistinctly. 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 indistinct shouting. Indistinct exchange. Indistinct, indistinct, indistinct chatter. Hot, indistinct indistinct talking. talking. Many, Many people, people talking, talking indistinctly. indistinctly. Train whistle blows. Train whistle blowing. Whistle blowing. Train whistle blowing. Whistle blowing. Whistle continues. Whistle blowing continues. Officer blows whistle. And the last book uh, I wanted to talk you about. This is really simple and it took me like a minute to figure it out. This is uh, regional restrictions and it's only this. Uh, this sentence repeats 30 times. This movie is not available in your country. Uh, for example, uh, when, when you have Netflix in Chile, I don't know if you know that, but uh, if you see Netflix in Chile, you, you access different movies than in England or in, in United States, for example. Uh, because of the copyrights in different countries, different continents, etc. And of course, Netflix in Chile uh, has uh, less movies than, than in, in America. And sometimes you can find a movie and you want to put it or, or you want to watch a YouTube video and it says this movie is not available in your country. When you live in Chile and you live really in the far, but literally in, in the end of, of the world, the, the country was called uh, Finisterra uh, in, by the Spanish, so I'm not joking. It was it was real. Uh, you really always have has the uh, idea that you're far from from everywhere. That everything is uh, as Rambo said, uh, life is in another place. Uh, you you really have that that experience. You have to travel very long to to go for the places that things are occurring. So I wanted to play with this idea. This is a really simple book, and in my case, it had to be. It was like a melancholic. A poem for me, or like a melancholic message to feel that you are out of what was going on. So when I when I read this uh, this uh, this book in in the reading at uh, Printed Matter, I, I'm coming back to to that situation. I was really happy. I was thinking, oh, I'm reading uh, with some of the writers that I, I most admire. It was Simon, Nick, Craig Dorkin. Rob Fitzman, uh, Holy Herdon, wonderful friends and, and writers. I'm, I'm at my favorite bookstore in New York. I'm reading in English. I'm a cosmopolitan poet. I was really crazy. I was really happy. But just when I was reading, I, I thought of something. I, I was thinking, oh, this poem, specifically this one, this movie is not available in your country. It's about the loss, I feel, of not getting what is happening in other parts. But just when I was really, and in that moment, I started. I started saying, "This movie is not available in your country. This movie is not available in your country. This movie is not available in your country." And in that moment, I started thinking, "Well, maybe we can see it reverse. Maybe it's you that uh, are losing what is going on in my country or, or in other country." Uh, so I thought, "Latin America, than ever. <laughs> it, was, it was a joke. It was uh, everything going reverse." So I was with all these things in mind, like feeling very cosmopolitan in a way, and in another way, like the most Latin American guy in the world. So <laughs> with all this, and a woman approached me at the end and said, "I really love what you what you just read. It's like." The suffering of the Latin, Latin American countries, the political, the dictatorship, you know, all the cliches of that you you receive when you live in Chile or Argentina or whatever. So it was, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, uh, I can try my best. I can I can't escape from from this. So it, it, it really helped me think a lot, and I, I I got really confused thinking all all these things. So and now I'm just in the time <coughs> to finish. Uh, uh, I try to figure out how to deal with all those cosmopolitic, uh, cosmopolitical interests and also local interests. How to deal with that? And I'll, 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 I want to explain. I'll just show you a video that uh, tries to deal with all this.
This movie is not available in your country. This movie is not available in your country. <laughs> this movie is not available in your country. <laughs> this movie is not available in your country. 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 No, it's This movie is not available in your country. In a shoe store right now, about to scream it. This movie is not available in your country! this I want to take this oh paper what's this paper this movie is not available in your country This movie is not available in your country. This movie is not available in your country. Yo! This movie is not available in your country. Got you. 